Artificial intelligence, or AI, is often thought of as futuristic, but computers have been getting more artificially intelligent for quite some time now. From simple web search that learns with you to Watson, the IBM computer who could beat a human at Jeopardy, to who knows where next. Richard Water, West Coast editor of Financial Times, joins us now to discuss artificial intelligence and where it's heading. So it's a big question. Where is it heading? Well, it's been heading in one direction for 60 years. It's just taken a long time getting there. I think the... As the name suggests, it essentially implies that computers can become as smart as people. That was a vision that uh, you know some of the early computer scientists had. They were way ahead of themselves. The technology just wasn't ready. And so the history of artificial intelligence has been a history of, of disappointment. Uh, and the, people talked about the AI winter mm. in the 80s and the 90s because nothing happened. Um, well, we are now in a boom time for artificial intelligence because guess what? The, the technology has finally caught up. Computing power is now growing astronomically. And so a lot of the, the kind of hopes um, are starting to be realised. Um, it's not that computers are as smart as people yet, but they're doing things, in the last two to three years in particular, they've started to do things that nobody thought was possible. For example? Uh, well, so you mentioned Watson. Understanding language is an incredibly hard thing to do. It's and we find it very easy. Computers haven't been able to do that. Uh, for a computer to be able to beat a human at jeopardy, a word game which involves complex puns uh, is just very, very, very hard. And when IBM did that three years ago, a lot of people in computer science were, you know, quite frankly shocked. And um, you know, it's quite a breakthrough. So that's now that's one example. That's sort of you could you could shove all of Wikipedia into a box and hopefully it can be faster than Ken Jennings. But um, what are the kind of real hopes for that scientists have beyond the kind of game application? How do they see computers interacting with us to perhaps solve some of life's big mysteries and challenges? Well, I think the, the Watson example um, is uh, based on what is known as machine learning. So essentially what you're doing is you're pumping vast amounts of data. So this takes advantage of, of big data, which has been the big, the big jargon in the tech industry. Um, so you're pumping all that data into a machine and it's finding patterns. It's hunting through things and finding answers that, uh, you know, that humans could find if our brains were big enough and they aren't. Now, if you apply that to all kinds of fields, say medicine, um, the potential in, for instance, uh, disease discovery or, or finding solutions to cancer, um, actually, you know, it, it might become possible. And so IBM is already doing that. A lot of companies are, are looking at, uh, at health care, at um, the environment, for instance. So climate change is a, is a a very, very complex area. You know, potentially in 10 years' time, we could solve some of these problems. Of course, solving the politics, you know, is going to take longer, but the science, actually, we could start to find answers. So on the hopes and dreams side, there's the cure to cancer, which might be assisted by AI. And there, along with the hopes, there's also this kind of fear threat. I mean, Stephen Hawking, a brilliant scientist, said that, you know, it, this, this, this moment, this singularity, when computers get smarter than us might actually be the beginning of the end of us. Um, wh why are they so scared? I mean, it seems counterintuitive that, you know, that we would build a machine that we could no longer control. And yet, you know, the, it's, 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 it's the story of all complex systems, if you like. We already know from uh, even the air traffic control systems we build. We have plane crashes because humans flying machines interacting with computers make mistakes. Um, well, if you, uh, if you now multiply that by a factor of a 1,000 or a million and think about what an incredibly intelligent computer would do designed by humans, you can start to see that there would be unintended consequences we simply couldn't anticipate. And then if you marry that with the fact that very soon the computers will be building themselves. Once they become as intelligent as people, they won't expect us to improve them. They'll, they'll be able to do a better job themselves. Right. And so how will they explain to us with smaller brains what they're doing to improve themselves? Let's kind of game this out in uh, some of the ripple effects or the consequences, unintended or otherwise. I mean, how does a society function where you have this class that is enormously more intelligent and more capable in certain ways. And we kind of humans are just kind of walking around, still having to eat food and still having to go to sleep at night, et cetera. I mean, I mean let's say, for example, even how, how we govern. I mean, what does democracy do in the light of this inequity? Well, 
we're already going to be facing some of these issues in the next five to ten years because complex algorithms fed by vast amounts of data are going to be starting to optimise many parts of our life. You know, we're currently living in, in, an, in, in an era of data overload and internet overload, and we can't find the answers we want and we can't sort all this information to make the right decisions. And our leaders ha are in a similar position. They have a lot of expertise backing them up, but they're relying increasingly on computers to, and I think artificial intelligent computers like Watson will be playing this role in the next five to 10 years to sort through you know, the various information they need to make very complex policy decisions and to recommend the optimized route. And it's gonna become very hard for humans to turn their back on a machine that gives you a preferred answer. Yeah. We like to think that humans will still make the decisions and we will, but how do we second guess the machines when they start to become smarter? It's gonna become very complex. And who makes these machines? I mean, in 25, 35 years ago, you could say the only people with the big enough checkbooks were say DARPA or some sort of government funded agency somewhere around the world, but increasingly that's not the case and it's more likely to be a private corporation, whether it's Apple or it's Google or it's Facebook or who has these large data sets and who has the computing power and keeps building it? Well, you put your finger on it. This is now, AI is now a race between a handful of very big corporations. Uh, Google, obviously, uh, Facebook that has three AI labs around the world, Amazon, uh, Baidu in China. And the reason these companies are investing so heavily is because this is the future of the information business, if you like, that if Google and Facebook exist and make money because they help us to find things we're interested in. Well, AI will take that a big step further and will help to sort the world for us. Um, if you can imagine marrying Watson, you know, this question and answer voice activated uh, thing with um, a machine behind it that can sort all the world's information, then, and you can put it on a smartphone, then you can very quickly see that the world will change because Anything we want, we will simply talk to our phones. And that's a vision that all these big companies are chasing very fast. Well, this is also a vision that the, uh, the, the movie Her had, right? Where, where people were having these relationships with their smartphones. And, and uh, obviously the director intentionally made it out where people were walking down the streets and they weren't actually having conversations with other human beings. They were having conversations with their kind of AI. Well, we already live in that world. You walk down the street and people are looking at their phones at the moment. Right. If you'd shown that image to people 10 years ago, it would have seemed like some future they couldn't imagine because we didn't have smartphones. Um, so why shouldn't we be talking to them? All right, Richard Waters, the West Coast editor of the Financial Times. Thanks so much. Pleasure.